Okay, so you'll uh, recall we're, um, we're going to be starting a, a new series of um, messages for Sunday morning in the book of Ephesians. Uh, for the last few weeks this has been kind of an in, in, introductory to that. So, so uh, this, is, um, this message this morning is entitled um, Ephesians Introduction Part 4. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so quite clever that one, isn't it? <laughs> Ephesians Introduction Part 4. And uh, you'll be glad to hear we're going to, uh, God, well, God willing, we're, we're going to be start, starting on the actual epistle next next Sunday, um, God willing. Um, sorry? <laughs> Indeed. Um, but, uh, but I did feel this, it was necessary to, to, to bring this introduction the way we have, because, I, I mean, I'm primarily... Um, Concerned that we, we, we understand that the world that we're living in is just like Ephesus was. I mean, the buildings might be different and the way people comb the hair might be different and the clothes that we wear and the way we speak might be different, but, but essentially, we live in Ephesus, folks. You know, so, so all, the same, all the same pressures and challenges that the believers in the church at Ephesus face, we face them today. The, the, the kind of world, the sort of beliefs and the morals and everything else that, that existed in Ephesus, it's just the same in the world that we're living in today. And, and so, so my first purpose in this four weeks of introduction was, was that we understand that. But, but also, I'm, I'm trying to enthuse us for the book of, of, of Ephesians, which is a most wonderful part of Scripture and, and contains... I think, really, in, in a most wonderful and concise way, the whole counsel of God. So, so as, we, as we begin next week in the book of Ephesians, I am certain this is going to bless us and help us and encourage us and, and hopefully help to establish us in our faith. Remember as we were, we were finishing Paul's epistle to the Romans, you know, that um, he was praying there that they be established. And, and he, he describes some of the things that God, God has and God uses in order to establish us in our faith and in our relationship with Jesus, in our relationship with God. And, and so the book of Ephesians will help us, all of us, enormously with that. And it doesn't matter how long we've been walking with the Lord, whether, we've been, whether we're relatively new believers or whether we've been on the way for a very long time, you know, it don't get better than the book of Ephesians, okay? So, so I'm trying to enthuse everyone to, to, to that. But, uh, but uh, this morning, we, we, uh, we're uh, in, in the last part of our introduction here in chapter 20. So, so I'm going to read from verse 17 down to the end of the chapter. It says, From Miletus, he, that is Paul, sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they had come to him, he said to them, you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived among you, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. And see, now I go bound in spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit testifies in every city, saying that chains and tribulations await me. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy, and the ministry which I receive from the Lord Jesus, so to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And indeed now I know that you all among whom I have gone preaching the kingdom of God will see my face no more. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. For I know this that after my departure savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. So now, brethren, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace, which is able to build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. 
I have coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel. Yes, you yourselves know that these hands have provided for my necessities and for those who were with me. I have shown you in every way by labouring like this that you must support the weak. And remember the words of the Lord Jesus that he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. And when he had said these things, he knelt down and prayed with them all. Then they all wept freely and fell on Paul's neck and kissed him, sorrowing most of all for the words which he spoke, that they would see his face no more. And they accompanied him to the ship. Okay, so, so you recall last week we were, we were thinking about the importance of having a proper understanding of what um, actually Acts chapter 18 verse 26 calls the way of God. How important it is that we have a proper understanding of the way of God. And we, we, we read there in that section in, in, in Acts 18 about this man Apollos who'd come to Ephesus. And it, it tells us that Apollos was an eloquent man. And, uh, and uh, he was, it says, mighty in the scriptures. That is to say, he knew the scriptures very very well we're talking about the old testament scriptures he was an expert in the scriptures he knew the scriptures he he was mighty in the scriptures and it said he'd been instructed in the way of the lord and was fervent in spirit and it's interesting that word fervent means boiling (laughs) he was boiling in the spirit in other words he's one of these kind of i mean i mean imagine john the baptist you know that that's a man who was boiling you know what I mean? You, di- you didn't go to John the Baptist for a nice, calm, like, ple- like pleasant, easy, to- easy listening kind of a message, did you? It was boiling in the spirit. Well, Apollos was like that. Yet, yet Aquila and Priscilla, Paul's friends and companions in the work of the gospel, realized when they heard him that there was something missing. There was something lacking in his preaching. It wasn't his knowledge of the scriptures. He was an expert in the scriptures. It wasn't that he, 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 lacked, he lacked fervency. He's boiling. <laughs> you know what I mean? This, this guy's like, he's red hot in that sense. But um, it was that there was, there was something, something lacking in his message. There, there was nothing wrong with anything he said. It's just that there was something missing. His message was incomplete. And so the problem was, as we saw last week that his understanding and his experience only went as far as John the Baptist. So, so they took him to one side, as it were, and they explained to him the way of God more accurately. And as I said last week, it seems to me that that, that means more than just they taught him about the Holy Spirit. And, and it's interesting, because the website's being redesigned, I, I think I might have said this last week, I don't know, but, but I, I, I was flicking through some things there and I noticed, years ago I did a series on Acts of the Apostles, probably lasted about five years, and we, we, we preached through Acts, and I, and I happened to stumble across the passage about Apollos, and when I looked, the title of it had something to do with, you know, um, um, Aquila and Priscilla, uh, teach Apollos about the baptism with the Holy Spirit. So, so when I preached on it, then I must have been thinking that 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 was that was it. They taught him. I haven't listened to the sermon. I can't stand listening to myself. But but uh, but probably I taught that it was they were they were kind of introducing him more to the work of the Holy Spirit and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But actually, if I thought that back that back then, what I would say now is that was only part of it. That was only part of it. As I tried to share last week, it seems to me what Aquila and Priscilla shared with Apollos included a a revelation of what the Apostle Paul calls the mystery hidden in ages past in Ephesians chapter 3. In other words, it's the revelation that is contained now in the entire New Testament, which of course at the time was only just being written and certainly wasn't compiled at that point in time. But what we have now in the New Testament is a complete revelation and it includes the mystery which was hidden in ages past. And and it, it, it includes that which is... Uh, uh, referred to in the passage I've just read here by the Apostle Paul as the whole counsel of God and so they instructed him more fully in these things and what I want to say is that that is all contained uh, in a most wonderful and concise way in the 
Paul's epistle to the Ephesians you see in six short chapters it's condensed into all of that as we'll see okay so it's the whole counsel of God and the, and the point is friends we all need this as Christian believers we need to know what we believe I mean that's the most obvious thing to say isn't it and yet honestly I've met Christians in my time and it seems to escape them that they need to know what they believe we need to know what we believe and and at the very least we need to have a grasp of what Paul refers to as the elementary principles Uh, there in in Hebrews chapter 6 and verse 1 he refers to what he calls the elementary principles In, in other words the basic stuff as Christian believers we need to understand at the very least the basic stuff and it's interesting what he includes in the elementary principles in in, uh, Hebrews chapter 6 verses 1 and 2 he includes repentance from dead works faith towards God the doctrine of baptisms and it's plural by the way baptisms because there's more than one kind of baptism you know there's at least three that are very very important for Christian believers so he he includes the doctrine of baptisms the laying on of hands resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment and uh, and so he includes all of that as the absolute basic stuff the the elementary principles but in that passage he says we need to go on from there and we need to go on to perfection he says and what and what he means by that is we need to come to a more perfect understanding of the truths of the christian faith the faith once delivered to the saints as jude calls it in jude 3 and that ultimately means the whole counsel of God so I would suggest to everyone probably take, take, take the notice of me if, you, if, 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 if that's the way you see it but, it but if you take my advice you would make it your lifelong uh, project to grow in your understanding of the whole counsel of God you'd make that your lifelong project so so from being a baby christian if i'm talking to any relatively new believers this morning from being a baby christian make it your lifelong aim to come to a a perfect understanding of the whole counsel of god and um and so uh, 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 Aquila and Priscilla they helped Apollos with this but it's clear from what Paul says in the passage that I just read from Acts 20 that this is not just for preachers and pastors and elders and leaders in the church but it's for all of us you know it's it's you you, you know you the preacher ought to be informed he ought to he ought to know his bible but don't all think well that's just for the pastor it's for all of us and and it's the privilege we we, we all have a privilege to actually understand these things that can't be understood with the, the mere human mind but they're spiritually discerned but God's given us his Holy Spirit to interpret his word to us so that we we can understand these things and so Ephesians I I, I think will will uh, help us with this okay so this morning then I want to draw your attention to this passage in in Acts chapter 20 verses 17 to 38 and again this is not meant in any way to be a a kind of exposition of the whole passage but but I just want to pull some things out of this this morning by way of introduction okay so he tells us there Paul tells us that he spent a total of three years in 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 Ephesus and uh, he began his mission there among the Jews and proselytes in the synagogue where for three months it tells us in um, uh, uh, chapter uh, 19 he's for three months he spoke boldly reasoning and persuading concerning the things of the kingdom of God actually that's chapter 18 verse 8 and uh, and and so what he was doing he was showing from the scriptures that Messiah must suffer before he enters into his glory and he was proving from the scriptures that Jesus is in fact the Messiah that Jews have been waiting for so so how does he do that how does Paul um, 
show from the scriptures that Messiah had to suffer before entering his glory and how does he show from the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah how does he do that well he simply shows how that Jesus fulfills all the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah so, so the Old Testament says for example which town he would be born in Bethlehem the city of David and he shows how Jesus was born at Bethlehem it's, it says where he would grow up Jesus grows up in, in Nazareth it talks about um, his, his, his uh, parents and, uh, and the as it were um, the, 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 I don't know what the word is, is of, of his mother that she would be a virgin what's the word I'm looking for the, the, anyway it doesn't matter it, it, the Old Testament says that she would be a virgin and so he, he points this out he, he points out that, that as a young child he would go into Egypt and then return to the land of Israel it, the Old Testament tells us all these things and aspects of his ministry and everything else his, his, his death, his resurrection it's, it's all there in the Old Testament right down to the very calendar date when Jesus would ride into Jer Jerusalem on a donkey and be proclaimed publicly as the Messiah of Israel, the very calendar date is prophesied. So by, by pointing to all these Old Testament scriptures and showing how that Jesus and Jesus alone fulfilled all of those, he shows from the scriptures that Jesus is Messiah. Now the result of this was that some believed and others didn't. In fact, the ones who didn't believe, it says in verse 9 of chapter 18, were hardened. They did not believe because they were hardened, uh, hardened themselves, and they spoke evil, it says, of the way before the multitude. They spoke evil of the way before the multitude. And the way is the Christian faith, you see. Before Christianity was called Christianity, it was called the way. So, so these people who hardened themselves against Christ, who hardened themselves against the gospel, they spoke evil against the way before the multitude. Isn't that sad? When those who consider themselves to be the people of God speak evil of the way of God and they do it before unbelievers. Isn't that sad? So then what Paul did was he took the believers and he departed from those in the synagogue. But God opened a great door of opportunity for the gospel in another part of town. In fact, I, I, actually, the apostle refers to this at the end of his epistle to, to the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians in chapter um, 16, he says, um, verse 7, I do not wish to see you now on the way, but I hope to stay a while with you if the Lord permits but I will tarry in Ephesus until Pentecost for a great and effective door has opened to me and there are many adversaries so, so he's talking about what was going on whilst he was in Ephesus and he says, he says a great door of opportunity God has opened to me and, and, he, and so he's left the synagogue he's left the place where the Jews are and those who are uh, disagreeable and argue, argumentative about it who've hardened themselves and he departs from there he takes the believers and uh, God opens this door of opportunity for the gospel in another part of town it tells us that they met daily in this place called the school of Tyrannus and they continued there for the next two years and the result was it tells us in chapter uh, uh, 19 that all who dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus both Jews and Greeks now when it says all in Asia it doesn't necessarily mean every individual what it means is multitudes of people from Asia got to hear the gospel over that two year period period whereas if you think about it had he remained in that synagogue only Jews and proselytes would have heard and he might well have spent the whole time just reasoning and arguing with those who were not listening anyway because they'd hardened themselves against the gospel sometimes you know we've got to move on and it, it doesn't it, it may break our heart to do it but sometimes God God encourages us to move on to another place now of course we, we are here in Chorley and so I, I've always considered that 
you know, because we're here in Charlie, we should be preaching the gospel here in Charlie. And so we do our open air regularly, and I've continued to do for well over the, t- the last 20 years or so, you know. Um, but there are times when you've got to move on from a thing. And, and Jesus himself said to his disciples, didn't he? You know, if the place doesn't welcome you, dust, br- brush the dust from off your feet and go, go elsewhere. Because you can, you can waste all your time with those who are not listening anyway. And, and so you've got to hear from God for that, by the way. But, uh, but God, God moves him on. And, uh, and, and I reckon Paul was very sad over the response that, that came from many of those Jews in the synagogue. But once the Lord had opened this new door of opportunity, his heart must have been filled with joy. Joy at seeing many, both Jews and Gentiles, come into faith in Christ. Joy at seeing God working powerfully in the midst. Do you remember what it says? That unusual miracles were done at the hand of Paul. And, uh, and uh, evil spirits were cast out of those who were possessed and all the rest of it. So, so God, is, God was evidently working powerfully amongst them. And, and, and joy at seeing the fruit of genuine conversions when those who'd previously been bound up in the occult were bringing the books of spells and occult books and I guess the occult paraphernalia and burning it publicly regardless as to the, the value of it. That's a real conversion, you know. And, and others who've been bound up in idolatry, serving idols, quit patronising the temple of Artemis or, or, or the other temples and buying replicas of the shrine of Artemis or, or the, 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 the effigy of, of, of Artemis quit buying all of that in fact destroyed what they had this was a true revival and the power of the gospel was so evidently at work in that place that place that was a demonic stronghold that demonic stronghold was under attack from the gospel of God and God was saving people But of course, because that demonic stronghold was under attack from the gospel, that provoked a response from the powers of darkness. Always does. See, Satan doesn't care when wishy-washy, half-hearted Christians are so entangled with the world that you can't even tell the difference between them and the world. Don't bother Satan one bit, that. Leave them alone. Couldn't care less. He doesn't care about a church that looks and sounds so much like the world that the world can't see any difference and would actually feel quite comfortable and at home there. Satan doesn't care about that at all. Let him get on with it. But when Christians and churches start living their faith and they are active with the gospel, he doesn't like that. Because the gospel, you see, is a threat to him and his kingdom and Christians who are alive and awake and full of the Holy Ghost are a threat to him and his kingdom so, so the powers of darkness start to react and, and first of all persecution breaks out in Ephesus and, uh, and it starts in the synagogue of course where, where, where the Jews saw the gospel as a threat to Judaism and so they respond by speaking evil of the way before the multitude and and those in the city who were profiting from uh, from from the fact that many people were in bondage to idols because they made their living out of selling silver shrines, uh, ref- uh, effigies of, of Diana and replicas of the, 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 sh- the shrine and everything, um, uh, they realised that their livelihood was under threat. And so they responded by beating Christians up, it says, and by trying to get the gospel banned. The evil spirits who are behind those idols and uh, the power behind the occult the power that makes it work because it does work by the way you know don't be fooled by these tricksters who come on TV and do the card tricks or whatever they do and they call themselves magicians that's not it, that's tricks 
but there is a magic that works it is possible to curse someone it is possible to to make portions that make things happen and and and, and it works but the, the power that is behind that is evil you know it's, it's interesting you know some of them call themselves white witches and some of them call themselves black witches and white witches said say well we're witches but we only do good things through our witchcraft we heal people and things like that and the black witch well he curses people and and, and things like that it's all witchcraft yeah. and it's the same power that works both okay so 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 these these powers of evil that were behind the occult and behind the idolatry well they react by by increasing demonic activity in the city so we read about people that are possessed by demons there you see and uh, but nevertheless paul continued there for three years preaching and teaching publicly in places like the school of tyrannus and from house to house and uh, we've got to do the same folks because uh, the exact same reaction comes when we share th- when we live out our faith and when we share the gospel the exact same reaction comes you get the so-called religious people who who are offended by a gospel that says that unless a man is born again he shall not enter the kingdom of god they they are offended and i'm talking about not just those in Judaism here and those in other religions I'm talking about people in the so-called Christian church who object to a message that says that without repentance and without faith you cannot be saved they actually reject that I I remember some of us years ago you know we went to this meeting in another church in uh, just outside Chorley where um, the the bloke who was a pastor at that time had invited a friend of his to come and speak and they advertised it in the paper and everything and his friend was a was a Muslim imam and uh, and he, he came to give a talk on, uh, I think it was entitled something like 12 Things Christians Need to Know About Muslims or something. And, uh, and, it, and, it, this, and this bloke began by, by uh, well, he began by praying in Arabic over the thing. And I knew exactly what he was doing. He was proclaiming the Lordship of Allah over that place to begin with. And anyway, he gave his talk and there was any questions. And, and, and I'd already pre-arranged what my questions were. And my questions were, were aimed at um, speaking the gospel in as short and concise way as I could in the form of a question. And, 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 the, and, the que- and so I stood up and I said, and it was something to the effect of... Uh, According to the Bible, you know, you know, we have all sinned. Our sins are an offence to God, but God's provided atonement for our sins through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. What is there in Islam to deal with man's sin? My question was something like that. and I said, my, my reason for asking it was to preach the gospel to people after they listened to this bloke talking about Islam for, for, for however long. And he stood up, this imam, and he said... Um, Oh, actually, before he did, the pastor stood up and he said something like, uh, well, something to the effect of, we, we have irritating people in, in the Christian church as well as I'm sure you do in, you know. He didn't, it wasn't those words, but that's basically what he meant. I think he was embarrassed by my question. And, and, and the imam stood up then and, and, uh, and, and he said, basically, uh, Allah doesn't need... Uh, an atonement Allah doesn't need uh, a sacrifice if Allah wants to forgive Allah just forgives he doesn't need a sacrifice that was his answer well Allah is unjust then because because sin must be dealt with justly anyway anyway but but the point is that he didn't call me an irritant he 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 basically was embarrassed by the fact that I had stood up and asked what what I asked and 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 that is what I'm talking about here that the the reaction to to the gospel even from some in the Christian church is to speak evil of it before the multitudes he says there's 300 odd people in that meeting the place was packed and, and, and it's the same with there are those who profit from people's sin and when, when people get saved they, they don't lose their income so they react and, but of course what's, what is 
worst of all if I can put it that way is that when the gospel starts to attack the kingdom of Satan the demons react and so it doesn't surprise me to see in our nation today there is an increase in demonic activity there is no question about it there are things that are happening today that you cannot explain apart from the demonic some of the things that people are doing today are just demonic it's as simple as that you 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 can spend all day saying dear me you know how how on earth would somebody do something like i'll tell you how it's demonic what is happening so that so there's this rise of the demonic but what paul did was he carried on and that's what we've got to do we've got to carry on no matter what comes against us we have to carry on with the gospel i expect to see more opposition in the days ahead not less I expect to see greater persecution of genuine Christian believers. But if we stay strong and remain faithful, God may open to us a door of opportunity for the gospel, the likes of which we've not yet seen so far. Okay, so so the apostle... Paul finally left Ephesus after about three years and, uh, and it tells us that he travelled through Greece preaching the gospel and teaching the believers there. That's chapter 20 verses 1 to 16. So being directed then by the Holy Spirit to return to Jerusalem and hoping to be there by the day of Pentecost, he began his journey back to Jerusalem. But the church at Ephesus founded under his ministry remain very much on Paul's heart and he, he, he felt in his spirit he needed to speak to the elders of the church sensing in his heart that he was never going to be in Ephesus again he was never going to see the face again what we have here in this passage that I read at the beginning is Paul's final words in person to the elders of the church at Ephesus and it contains instruction and it contains a warning so so let's take a brief look this morning at what the apostle Paul said to these men because this more certainly applies to the church of Jesus Christ today definitely it applies to us okay so chapter 20 and verses 18 to 21 there Paul reminds them of his ministry among them and his example he says in verse 18 you know from the first day that I came to Asia in what manner I always lived amongst you now Paul lived the way he did because he was a new creation in Christ first and foremost because he's a he's a child of God now that's why he lived the way he did but he also knew that the work of the gospel of gospel mission and of leadership in the church wasn't just about preaching and teaching the word of God that's very important but it isn't just about that it required it requires that one live it It requires that one show by example what it looks like. There's a a songwriter um, once wrote a song and he's talking about he's talking about the church in this song and he says you talk about a life of brotherly love show me someone who knows how to live it. And and, and I I honestly think that's what the world wants to see. You can take you can preach as for as loudly as loudly and for as longly as you as you like but what they want to see is what it looks like and and see Paul, Paul realized this that he needed to show by example and he needed to show people what it looks like and so Paul could say you know how I lived when I was with you that's your example and that is how you are to lead he's speaking to these Ephesian elders note what it says in um, 1 Corinthians and chapter 11 this again is the Apostle Paul writing chapter 11 verse 1 he says imitate me just as I also imitate Christ 
I said uh, probably a few months back, um, first car I ever owned, and I, I wanted to like get a sticker in it so I could it could be a witness, and and I got this sticker and put it in my back window, and it said, "Don't follow me, follow Christ," and and I, and I meant well, but do you know what I mean? That that that's a bit of a cop out, really, in a sense. In, yeah, I mean we we we're, we're pointing people to Christ. But we ought to also be able to say, Paul could say, imitate me as I imitate Christ. If you want to see what it looks like, look at me. That's a challenge, isn't it? Think about it. Interestingly, I sold that car. To, I, put a, I put an advert in the paper and um, somebody rang up to buy it. And um, there was a, I don't know if it's still burnt there, but there's an Islamic school over... Um, somewhere like Ramsbottom Way, somewhere like that. And it was a, it was a Muslim from this school. And, um, and he says, I haven't got any transport, can you bring it? <laughs> so I did. And it was during Friday prayers I arrived. There were, no, there were nobody around. And I drove in with my car with, don't follow me, follow Christ, written it back. And he came out and gave me the money and I went. <laughs> so so any, anyway, <laughs> I digress. But... Uh, but yeah, so, so Paul could say, you know, imitate me as I imitate Christ. And he, he's saying to these people, you know, you, you remember how I lived amongst you and what I did? Well, that's your example. Do what, do what I did. Um, and Paul's example, verse 19, was one of humility and uh, of serving the Lord and the Lord's people. It was one of, of working, working hard, verses 34 to 35. You know, he said, do you remember, I worked hard with my hands to supply my own needs and, 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 and all of that. And that's the example that he gave them. And uh, his example was also one of enduring through times of tribulation and persecution. Look at, uh, at verse 19, serving the Lord with all humility, with many tears and trials which happened to me by the plotting of the Jews. And there's an interesting verse in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where in verse 32, he says, If in the manner of men I have fought with beasts at Ephesus, what advantage is it to me if the dead do not rise? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. I always found that verse intriguing and wondered what he meant by that. Is he referring to, to his antagonists as beasts in Ephesus, or is it that he actually found himself in the arena at one point? I, don't, I, I really don't know the answer to that. Or was the threat of that kind of hanging over him and it never came to pass? But he says, if I have fought in the manner of men with beasts at Ephesus. You know, so, so th this man suffered persecution. He suffered the trials and, and he endured. And that was his example to us. He wasn't dodging it himself. But, but he himself suffered that. So, so Paul could say to these elders, just keep in mind the example I gave to you. May we all be able to say that and do that, folks. I, I, don't, I don't just mean go about saying, look at me. We shouldn't be doing that. We should be saying, look to Christ. But what I mean is, May our example of how we live out our faith be something that people can look at and say, that's what a Christian looks like. Okay, so next he reminds them of his ministry, what he preached, what he taught, and how he went about it. And I want to just draw your attention now to verses 20 and 21 and 26 and 27. Because for me, this is so important. He says, How I kept back nothing that was helpful, but proclaimed it to you, and taught you public, publicly and from house to house, testifying to Jews and also to Greeks, repentance towards God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Now go down to verse 26. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. Okay, so so the question we have to ask is, what did he preach and what did he teach? What was it that he considered to be helpful? I kept back nothing that would be helpful, he says. What was it he considered to be helpful? Well, it seems to me there are, there are two aspects to Paul's preaching and teaching ministry here in Ephesus. And as a matter of fact, it was the same wherever he went. Firstly, there is that which he preached to non-believers as well as believers. And then there is that that he taught to believers only. 
okay there's that which he taught to non-believers as well as believers and then secondly there's that that he taught to believers only to non-believers the message was verse 21 repentance towards God and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ the gospel in other words he didn't talk about I mean, preaching to the non-believer in the opener or in the house of Tyrannus or wherever he was when he's preaching to, to a gathering of people where there are unbelievers he's not talking to them about politics he's not talking to them about the Roman Empire he's not talking about philosophy you know and the difference between Platonism and Aristotelism and, and uh, Stoicism and Epicureanism he's not interested in any of that he doesn't go there he doesn't tell people how to live their lives he doesn't suggest to them that if they all started to you know, be, be nice to one another and do good deeds and help old ladies across the road and give to charity that they'll get to heaven he doesn't talk in those kind of terms he doesn't tell people how to live their lives he doesn't talk to them about predestination and election or the difference between Calvinism and Arminianism he doesn't even go there you say, of course not, Calvin wasn't born then. But, you know, but I'm, I'm talking about the, the doctrines espoused by those people. He doesn't talk about issues like predestination and election. To the unbeliever, the message is the need for repentance and faith in Christ. It's, it's the gospel, the message of the gospel. And do you know what he does? He stays on message as far as the unbeliever is concerned. I dare say that if somebody said, can I ask you a question? You know, can you can you tell me such and such? He'd say, "Well, I'll, I'll have I'll, we'll have a chat about that afterwards." And if it was a question about creation or a question about some other aspect of the Mosaic Law or whatever it was, he'd go to them and he'd talk to he'd give them their answer and he'd use it as a, a, a means of leading to the gospel. But whilst preaching to the unbeliever, he keeps it on message. The message is the gospel, and you know, for us folks, that's what we should do. We, we shouldn't go out telling people how to live their life or, or tell them whether to vote Labour or Conservative or whatever, whatever, whatever there is. We've got one message for the world and it's the Gospel. So we've, we've, got to, we've got to stay on message in that sense. Whereas to those who are saved, to those who by the grace of God had come to repentance and faith, he preaches to them the whole counsel of God. And he kept back nothing that would be profitable in other words he teaches it all he teaches it all so, so Paul had this kind of let's call it a two pronged approach to his ministry to his preaching and teaching ministry the gospel to them that are not saved and the whole counsel of God to them that are and, and I'll tell you that, that has always been my aim to try and do that that, that, that is the approach I've always tried to take to ministry to, to keep the message to the unsaved the gospel and to those who are saved and in meetings like this the whole counsel of God preach through the scriptures notice what Paul said in verse 26 therefore I testify to you this day I am innocent of the blood of all men in other words he was confident he discharged his responsibility in that sense he'd done what the Lord called him to do he'd fully preached the gospel to the unsaved and he would taught the word of God to those who believed because he knew that it's the word of God it's the whole counsel of God that causes growth in the believer and causes us to become established may the Lord help us to do the same in this fellowship okay but then he ends by warning them and us of what was coming so I just want to read verses 28 to 31 therefore take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood for I know this that after my departure savage wolves will come in among you not spurring the flock also from among yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves therefore watch and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears 
you recall I said earlier on in this message that the devil began to attack the church he attacked Paul and his colleagues and all those who, who, who believed through their ministry because his kingdom was, was threatened by the gospel and, and he began his attack um, by stirring up persecution against the believers and by attacking the message itself and persecution of course hurts any kind of persecution hurts severe persecution is extremely difficult for anyone to endure but having said that the reality is this that persecution purifies the believer and it refines the believer and it tends to purify the church since persecution separates the true from false believers when persecution comes false believers leave usually and so so persecution has the effect of of refining the church so so that the in the end the gospel always tends to prosper in times of persecution it's, it's incredible really when you think about it but you've only got to look at China today you know after what, what is it 70 years or whatever it is I don't know of, of communist rule and trying to eradicate Christianity from the country the church is more alive today than ever it's been it's absolutely on fire and alive and uh, see what I mean so, so, so this, is what, this is what happens in persecution which, which none of us want but it actually refines the church so, so what Satan does is he uses a different approach one that is more successful at destroying churches of ruining the testimony of weakening Christians and making the message ineffective what he does is he introduces false brethren into the church and enables them to get, gain an influence within the church these people then start to preach a false gospel or introduce false teaching or else they start to say this bit isn't relevant and that bit isn't relevant and oh you don't have to believe this to be a Christian and you don't have to believe that to be a Christian you don't have to believe in the resurrection to be a Christian you don't have to, you don't have to believe in you know, the substitutionary atoning death of Christ to be a Christian you don't have to believe in the virgin birth and so, so they introduce you see these ideas and, uh, and as it were uh, uh, attack the, the fundamental doctrines of the faith so that the whole counsel of God is no longer taught in the churches it's satanic so that in time those in the church end up like the sorts of people we read about in 2 Timothy and um, chapter 4 where Paul says the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine but according to their own desires because they have itching ears they will heap up for themselves teachers and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables so, so the end result is the church ends up being this place where, where the word of God isn't really taught anymore and, and in fact that, that many pastors don't even open the word of God anymore but they tell stories and they give fables and, and, and you know what a fable is a fable is a story with a meaning so it might all be very nice but it's far from the whole counsel of God it's, it's far from teaching through the scriptures so, so Paul warns the Ephesian elders of this here in his last meeting with them and notice what he says there in verses 29 to 30 know this that after my departure savage wolves will come in among you not spurring the flock in other words some of them will come in from outside I have to say folks that today that is easier for them to do than ever because they can come in from outside without even coming in through the door they come through the screen of your computer they come from on the television and, they, and, there's, and it's all out there isn't it in every, every kind of teaching imagine it's all out there so some come from outside but listen what he says also from among yourselves 
men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves in other words from your own number even from within your own fellowship people will rise up therefore watch he says and remember my ministry and the example I gave to you this is an Im as important today as ever it has been in fact if anything more so because the church is under attack okay so just in closing then this is where Paul's epistle to the Ephesians comes in because Ephesians was written a number of years later when Paul was actually in prison in Rome and uh, he's either still awaiting his trial or he's awaiting the outcome of his trial but the church in Ephesus and these believers are still very much on his heart and so they're under house arrest in Rome he's thinking to himself how can I help the believers in, 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 in Ephesus and, and the leadership of the church how can I help them and so what he does is he writes his epistle six short chapters but it's absolute dynamite from start to finish it is the whole counsel of God condensed into six chapters and he sends it to them and what a gift what a gift that was to that church and what a gift it is for the church today for our fellowship today so so God willing we'll, we'll be starting on that next week let's just uh, close then with our, our final hymn and then we'll close with a prayer